It's great to be here in uh, Helsinki with you. Can you hear me? Okay. I get worried about this, uh, this, this room. I'm just reflecting actually what a great party someone must have had last night when looking at those balloons up there, thinking this is a really boring business breakfast with you all sitting down here. Someone obviously had a good party here. And I'm trying to work out whether it was a kid's party that someone great and good in Helsinki came and sort of did, or whether it was some corporate party where we're all trying to be, uh, uh, trying to be fun. Because uh, this is actually what I think is fa fantastic about our industry, actually. Some of us don't really know whether to be fun and to be sort of social and digital and all here, here. And some of us don't really know to actually be in our suits and be the proper corporate people. And this is the structures we've always worked upon and this is what we're always going to do. Um, uh, so it's an interesting uh, mix. But yeah, thanks, Johanny. My name's Jonathan Bean. I'm the COO of My News Desk. Very little bit about my background is I started off as an in-house PR person at a television station in uh, London. Um, and I was doing the very old traditional stuff like, you know, when you're at the bottom of the food chain when you're putting clippings into clippings books back then before the era of the internet, writing press releases, selling them in, stuff like that. And then I um, went through, you know, different areas of working for, for different companies in, in uh, PR and PR services. Uh, and, um, you know, I sort of started with databases that were first books and then and then uh, sort of online databases and stuff like that. And I came to the conclusion that actually, you know, using these sort of just faceless email lists from providers was actually the wrong way to go. Uh, and somehow ended up at my news desk. Uh, um, and we've grown from a company of uh, uh, about 20 people three years ago to about 130. But I'll go in, into more of that uh, uh, as we go. Um, what we're really here to talk about, or what I'm here to talk about, is content and storytelling um, from organizations and how we can actually leverage content. Um, and don't worry, this presentation is not just going to be full of loads of screenshots of different campaigns and stuff like that. You can all go online and you know, read content marketing blogs uh, about this sort of stuff. What we did is we actually went out and um, of course our focus is on the newsroom because we see it as being the hub of content for companies. Um, and we actually um, researched the top 100 brands uh, in the world. Um, to see how their newsrooms fared, how they were actually doing with newsrooms, had they moved from an old PR world to a new PR world. And I'm going to share some of the findings with you at the end. And then Johanny is actually, we've also done a separate report uh, for uh, the Nordic region, which Finland comes out brilliantly in. Uh, and um, uh, Johanny will go through that with you. But here are some of the lessons. At the back, I'll do some lessons that, that we learned from that report. Uh, at the beginning, I'm just going to talk a little bit about storytelling, actually, uh, from a company perspective, and a very little bit about my news desk. So, uh, there we go, the content race. How are the top 100 brands doing, uh, telling their stories? You'll have to bear with me as well, because I don't have my clicker today. Usually I have a clicker, I, I, I click around, so I have to keep going back to the thing, but it will keep, uh, keep us alive. Um, so, I think this is a really interesting question to, to actually ask ourselves, what's the difference between PR and marketing? You know, and I was, well, I was brought up in a world that was very separated, that there was marketing over here and they had the big budgets and the advertising agencies and they could do that and we were the PR people, we were actually the storytellers or the writers or the copy people uh, that would uh, do great copy and sell into journalists. Um, but I think I've always reflected on that. The interesting thing I think about our industry now is it's truly coming together. Marketing, public relations, customer service. Of course, in small organizations, it's always been uh, that way. Um, and this is the thing I like, actually. Marketing, I tell you I'm good in bed. PR, someone else tells you I'm good in bed. Um, and I think that stands for today. You can talk all you want about you know, paid media, earned media, owned media, converging. Um, but it's still the fact, is it the company themselves actually um, telling you how good and how great you are? Or is it people that are experiencing that company's products and services? Whether they be journalists or they be consumers or they be partners or they be regulators, are they telling you uh, that it's good? And I think you know, if we were to pick up some stuff from, from you know, surveys like the Edelman Trust Index and stuff like that, you know, very much about who's telling you that is very, very important. Is it a person like you? Is it a person that you associate with in your network, uh, which is key? Um, but I think the key thing to do as organizations, as communicators, as marketers, is actually give stories um, for people to tell. And I think historically, <coughs> as an organization in PR, we've been good at sort of giving journalists stories to tell and appealing to them, but we need to widen that out. 
Anyway, you're not going to have any uh, stories about how good or bad I am in bed today, but uh, um, it's very important that we think about storytelling, I believe, in a new way. Um, because I think companies have the ability now to fill the gap um, that media houses are, are leaving behind. My news desk is part of a, a large Norwegian media house. Um, you know, I'm often in, in, in board meetings with them, and you see it firsthand, um, the trouble that media houses are in. In fact, I was at a board meeting last week and you know, uh, told them that they probably didn't have a business in 10 years' time. Um, but I truly believe that the void for quality journalism actually will be filled by companies, um, but in a very, very different uh, way. Um, so we'll see. But I'll give you a quick story. Here's the My News Desk uh, story. Um, our vision really is to create a much better way for brands to communicate to both the media uh, and other influencers. Uh, we're about 10 years old now, um, and we have around about uh, 40,000 companies uh, using My News Desk uh, from a global basis. Um, and, and how are we looking at doing that? We believe that there's two strong areas that companies can do this through. One of them is the newsroom, to have the own place on your site where you are bringing all that content together. Uh, you're bringing blog posts, you're bringing press releases, you're bringing video, you're bringing um, your contacts, you're bringing photos together in one place and control it. But what I see, you know, a lot of companies have, have newsrooms which quite frankly are very, very unengaging. Or they have newsrooms um, that are technically very correct. Technically very, they have everything. They have an image bank, they have um, press releases, they have blog posts, um, and actually Finland in our Nordic report has scored very, very highly, and Johanny's probably going to show off about that, saying the top, the top uh, 15 brands in, in Finland, they're beating all of those horrible Nordic neighbours because they don't know what they're doing, and we do. Um, but you know what most newsrooms are? They're completely uninspiring, they're completely unengaging, and they're full of just corporate rubbish that is not engaging to me as a, you know, you're laughing, I'm sure you've written many of those press releases and thinking, yeah, I know, so have I. Um, uh, and I think that's the mindset that needs to, so, you know, as good Finns, and I've worked now in Finland, or not, with Finland for probably 10 years, technically, you know, you are wonderful, you get all the pieces of the pie and you'll, you'll, you'll drive technology, you know, let's just, let's not mention the Nokia word, but, but you will drive technology um, in, in this area, you'll have everything. But the engagement, this is not a finished problem, this is a problem with PR and newsrooms full stop, is not there. Um, one of the things also is, is the network. Content and a newsroom is no good without there being a network, without there being people around that that are engaging. And whether those stakeholders are journalists, whether they're employees, whether they're partners, uh, all of the stakeholders in your business, whether they're investors, very, very crucial. So we focus on two major things. One is, one is a network and one is uh, newsrooms. So as I said, yeah, we have over 5,000 uh, newsrooms where people can actually go in, follow, subscribe content from newsrooms and have a network of, of, of newsrooms. Um, and there's us there, beautiful uh, big heart. Um, uh, I think some of our, some of our people. Um, we are about pushing the limits of the web uh, and using the web to improve marketing, PR and communications. Um, and the fascinating and frightening thing is our business is changing so quickly um, today. I sit there on the sofa with my three kids at seven, four, and one, and they're on iPads, iPhones, and um, uh, laptops. And I think, my God, their world, when they're consuming content, is completely different to the world that I grew up in. Um, but there you go. We've got, now got offices in uh, London, Berlin, um, Stockholm, um, uh, Oslo, uh, Denmark, all sorts of places all over the place. Um, and uh, we're very proud to be partnered with Desky here in, uh, in Finland, uh, who we believe are, are one of Finland's leading and most innovative PR agencies. Okay, so as we know, um, what we're driven through and the whole advent of the newsroom is about c technology, c technology improving communications. Um, and that's what we're all faced with today, I think, in, in our world. We all have the traditional... PR skills, we all know what potentially makes a good story, but I think the question that we're all asking ourselves is how do I actually use all of these, or, and do I actually have to use all of these technology platforms um, to make sure that I can now do my job in this, uh, in this modern world? Just one number I'd like you to, uh, to focus on, actually. 
Um, Robin Dunbar was a, a sort of evolutionary psychologist, and he uh, said that it's impossible to main a rela rain, uh, maintain a relationship with more than 150 people. And I've been doing a lot of thought about that because I've long, I've sold, you know, databases with thousands of obscure email. Who, actually, who uses a database with loads of email addresses on it now for their sort of press sending out of contacts? Hands up. Who, who uses, a, uses a database of lots of sort of email addresses for sending out press releases? You've got loads of press releases and you send it out to an email list of journalists that you don't, yeah, most people, yeah? How many people actually really know those people on those lists? All of them, yeah, fine, I love it. Great thing about PR people, fantastic liars as well. We go on about honesty, uh, no. But uh, I think that is a really interesting concept because we've done a lot of thought about that. How many, so, so in, in my world, when, when I was in PR, I thought, okay, I'll bring this list up. You know, it's got 100, 200, or, you know, 400, or even sometimes, we you know, when I used to sit with Nokia, you know, that we, ha we have 100 or 200,000 people on our lists and, and all of that sort of stuff. Actually, what sort of engagement and relationships are you having with those stakeholders? Um, as a communicator, I would just tick the box and say, yep, job done, tick the box, I've got my press content out to, you know, X number of journalists. Um, and then I sort of scratch my head if things weren't covered, but I've done my job. Um, but 150, actually 150 people, you know, a lot of research has been done about this. That's the maximum that you can actually, um, you know, um, uh, maintain a social relationship with. I would say even 150 is a little bit much, personally, but, but there you go, that was the research. And then I compared this number to actually the accounts that I follow on Twitter. I follow, I follow about 1,200 accounts on, uh, on Twitter. And I'm thinking, actually, what is this actually giving me? What is this, you know, am I getting engagement here? Am I on this platform? I've recently been on a kind of digital detox in South Africa for seven days. Uh, and I had my computer and my, and my phone taken away from me. I couldn't, take, I, couldn't, um, I couldn't speak to my family or anything like that. Don't worry, I'm not mentally ill. I, um, I'm doing an MBA program and this was, uh, this was uh, part of that. And they argued that basically because we are so attached to our devices uh, these days, no quality thought. Quality thought. So they took all these devices away, they stuck us in the bush and, bush and, and, and we thought. But I think that is actually going to be the secret to our industry going forward. Call it marketing, call it PR, call it customer service, you know, call it, call it what you want. Creativity will still be key. And the focus very much, I think, in the last five years has been about technology, how we can use technology and digital services. Um, but it, the creativity will drive our success or failure, uh, I believe, in... Um, but, you know, this will go on. You know, the accounts that I follow... I, I also had a, another guy, one of Norway's leading social media um, uh, sort of advocates. He's quit Twitter. He unfollowed everyone on Twitter and saying, actually, I used to play the game where I was just going to follow as many people and get as many followers, but I had no engagement, so I'm actually cutting it right down again. Um, but I think it's something that we need to think about, actually, how many of the relationships that we have online are... Um, you know, our real relationships and how many are just, you know, um, not. So, you know, yes, we know that we need to, technology changes communication. And actually, what does it mean for messages? For me, you know, communicating and getting your brand message across to a diverse group of audiences is a lot more complicated than it was, you know, 10 years ago. Um, you know, I'll just take th this one, which is obviously the BP um, spill, and I'm not going to go into a long sort of diatribe on, on that. But, you know, when, when I look at a story like that, you know, which is now from 2008 that it happened, you know, I still want to check as a, uh, you know, I'd, I'd check, you know, the BBC website, I'd check the New York Times, I'd check, you know, major media outlets. But what I would also check is I'd check, you know, the different social streams that I'm on, how people are reacting to that. I'd also check, you know, the NGOs maybe, what their opinions are. Different stakeholders to, to the stakeholder group that I would check as a news consumer, um, you know, five years ago. And that makes it incredibly uh, difficult. Also, I think we need, to, we need to accept now that actually news comes to me or news comes to you. Um, and fine, yeah, the newspaper is one, 
you know, you know, one way that, that, that the news comes to us. Uh, but more and more news is finding us. We are not going out and finding news. And I think many of you will have been, you know, over the last year, different news stories that you've picked up will, will have come through your social networks um, and through things that you've seen on the web. You wouldn't necessarily be just going out and searching for that. Um, but I just want to see who, um, uh, who saw this last year. Right now, there are more people on Facebook than there were on the planet 200 years ago. Humanity's greatest desire is to belong and connect. And now we see each other. We hear each other. Grandpa, I love you. I love you. Why well, won't I take a picture? We share what we love, and it reminds us what we all have in common. Dug out alive and well after seven and a half days. If you believe in yourself, you will know how to ride a bike, rock and roll. So now technically your device is on. Can you tell? Oh, it's exciting. And this connection is changing the way the world works. Governments are trying to keep up. Uh, no, we can't test the freedom. And older generations are concerned. Many people are very concerned about tomorrow. So they could get worse next year. The game has new rules. The next 27 minutes are an experiment. But in order for it to work, you have to pay attention. So, hands up, who actually saw that last year? Anyone saw that? I didn't actually, I didn't actually, when I first saw that first beginning clip, I didn't, uh, didn't see that. Um, okay, that's interesting. Um, who knows about this? Yeah, so, so a, a few of you. So, huge campaign last year, Coney 2012, um, which was basically done by an, an NGO called Invisible Children. Um, and it was one of the most viral campaigns last year. That's how the actual video started. Uh, and then there was a long half an hour video. And, and how I found out was via my Facebook friends actually sharing that content. And then we actually played the whole thing. We, we, in, in our office, we have a sort of screen like that. And actually, one lunchtime, we sat down and played the whole thing for, uh, for the office. But it all came out of viral content. And it was basically about a Ugandan war criminal, Joseph Kony, um, and bringing him to uh, rights. And it was a huge campaign. It was often cited as one of the biggest social media successes uh, of uh, 2012 in terms of viral, uh, viral effect. Um, but I think it was quite interesting to you know, take you through some of the timelines there that happened with Kony 2012. So on the 5th of March, Invisible Children posts that video, 30 minute video, um, uh, on YouTube. Um, and essentially, you know, three days, late, three days later, after launch, it had over 35 million views after celebrities basically started uh, putting it viral in their social networks. So they were actually recommending that people actually look at that using their networks, it actually sparked a huge amount of uh, viewership. So Justin Bieber and Rihanna spread the word. Um, so 35 million views, you know, and then after the celebrities came these guys uh, actually also endorsing the campaign um, and saying, you know, this is, you know, what was it? Uh, Obama's press secretary said something like, you know, we congratulate hundreds of thousands of Americans who've mobilized to this unique crisis of conscience. That's actually from the, from the White House themselves uh, talking about that. But not much was really known about the campaign. Not much was really known about the NGO. It wasn't this huge NGO, um, but it mobilized such great you know, viral uh, stories because within that video, it was a great story that was uh, told. But nine days actually after the launch, the film was actually screened in Uganda. 
uh, itself, the country it was supposed to be helping. Um, and this is their reaction. News of the screening spreads far and a large crowd gathers at sunset. They're expecting to watch a film that documents their suffering as they perceive it. For many people here, the video is simply puzzling. It contains footage of an American man, his son, and it documents events that happened here in northern Uganda years ago. But as the film progresses, puzzlement turns into anger. There are some kind of people, there are some kind of NGO who are trying to mobilize fun using the atrocities, atrocities committed in northern Uganda. Yes. We wanted to see how our local people were killed. Correct. So these are all white men. These are feelings different from northern Uganda. That is why sometimes... <laughs> Rocks are thrown, the screening comes to a halt, and the crowd scatters into the night. Kony 2012 may be the most watched video on YouTube this year, but it clearly doesn't resonate with many of the people it claims it's meant to help. Malcolm Webb, Al Jazeera, in Lira Town, northern Uganda. So I think, you know, this, the story there was basically um, that, that they had a great video. It was very slick. For those of you that saw the 30-minute video, it was very powerful, actually. I sat down and, you know, watched it. It was really, really powerful. Um, but it was, you know, very much a film. It, was, it, was, uh, it wasn't really that truthful, open and honest, particularly when you look at the the people that it was supposed to be supposed to be uh, helping. And then this is quite funny, 10 days after the launch, this is actually the NGO Invisible Children's co-founder uh, went a little crazy. Um, what? That's not your average crazy person going on a naked, obscenity-filled rant in the middle of the day. It's Jason Russell, the filmmaker behind the Coney 2012 video that exploded on the internet. Jason Russell was, uh, had a breakdown. To put it mildly, yes. Jason hit the streets of San Diego, naked, cursing, smacking the pavement, and screaming about the devil. Eventually, he was detained on a psychiatric hold. Oh, so interesting. Uh, obviously, that campaign got to him extremely uh, creative. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, actually, I think for me, one of the biggest areas, areas was the trust and the openness of that campaign. So a lot's been talked about that campaign in terms of the virality of it, the fact that I think now it's got 97 million views on, on YouTube. Um, but actually, me as a consumer, when I actually consume that piece of that story or that content, what I was actually looking for was not the marketing gloss. I was actually looking for a newsroom, funnily enough. I was wanting to go to the Invisible Children's website, and they have a newsroom on their website, but it's very much, you know, it's like a bunch of videos, and, and, and uh, it's like a cinema, basically. Uh, but I wanted some information, some facts about this. Is it, you know, what, what was this? It's boring information, actually. I wanted some of that information to mix with the storytelling. And I think for, for communicators as us, as we are, it's that mix of inspiring storytelling and factual information about the organisations that we actually work with, which is the combination that we need to, you know, get together. Um, so trust and openness has always been a, a hugely debated and uh, argued case for all public relations and communications professionals. And some people I know really go down that trust and, and transparency route and other communications professionals I know go down that you know we are in the art of spin and we'll go and you know we'll go and do this depending on which sector you work in uh, the entertainment business it takes things a little bit too far but um, I think you know this area how do we gain trust we gain trust actually through our storytelling um, and our openness but uh, it's, it's a big issue for us also I think another big question is actually thinking big how can we think big as organisations? Um, and obviously last year, I think one of the biggest stories that uh, came out um, was uh, this one, which amazed me.
So uh, I guess everyone saw that one last year. Um, but I, I think you know what, what resonated with me was there in terms of storytelling. So how come that a fizzy drink produces a fizzy drink produces probably one of the um, people will argue with me, but for me, one of the most important space stories of the last 25 years. I don't know how many you know, rockets have, have, uh, have, have gone up over the last 25 years, probably a lot, and you know, to be quite honest with you, I'm not this sort of space freak, but that really resonated with me. And I, I've done a lot of stuff with Red Bull, and, and you know, years ago we talked about Red Bull transitioning its, um, transitioning its mindset from being, are we in the drinks business? Or are we in the lifestyle business? Are we actually a lifestyle brand, a sports lifestyle brand? Let's actually look at information on that and storytelling on that angle, rather than just being we are a fizzy drinks brand and here is exactly what we do and this is what goes into the fizzy drinks and everything like that. Um, but you know, some of the lessons I think that we can learn from that um, is, uh, is, is quite uh, important. And of course, multi-channel is, you know, they actually took that story and. I'm fully aware that not all of us have the resources that Red Bull have to do into the, the stunts, but we can take the same lessons. Um, and for me, you know, they stream that content over hundreds of different websites. They had their own dedicated websites, and they were on every single channel. So it was very much a multi-channel approach. It wasn't just your own website. Uh, it was a multi-channel approach that they, uh, that they took. They really did maximise content uh, there. Um, and so they... They, they maximised content, both in terms of the visuals that they were taking, but they really segmented their audiences as well. So they had, you know, they took one event, but they had actually uh, scientific bloggers, for example, were one thing. The scientific bloggers, they had separate stories around that content, around all of the different scientific stuff that went behind it. Um, and then you had, you know, space people as well that had a specific, um, uh, specific uh, stories. So it was one event, but really it was a, they maximised the, uh, the, the content. Um, some, some, you know, they made it easy to use, to share, and to you know, remix, and that was very, very important. Um, they had what they call a content pool, and what we call actually a newsroom, because we believe that providing organisations with their own newsroom, um, which they can have all of their content assets, that most importantly they can control as well. Not because a lot of the feedback we get as an organisation is, you know, but our IT department, you know, controls our website, and that's, you know, yes, we can have our newsroom area on it, but it's, you know, it's set. Um, we actually, at the communications and PR people, control that newsroom or that content hub. So um, here's the here's the. Uh, what we believe is, is the, the future of communications for organisations actually becoming their own media and telling stories. And then we'll move on to just some of the lessons that we, we took from the global report. And as I said, actually the Nordic report that, that Johanny will go through with you is actually you know, a lot more positive. I think you know, being a Brit myself, uh, having worked in the US uh, and, and also having lived now in the, the Nordic region, I live in Stockholm, for, for five years, I truly think the Nordic communicators are ahead of the game. Um, on this, but there's a lot more to there's a lot further to go in our communications because I think when I look at newsrooms, they're still pretty. You know, here's the latest press release about our product X Y Z, uh, and it's pretty unengaging. But I've actually decided to do the, our, our findings from the global report in like a Ten Commandments. Uh, uh, I'm not actually that religious a person myself, but I thought it would be quite fun to uh, to, to do. Don't hold that against me. So first one. Uh, they, thou shalt build your network. Um, I think that is, that is crucial, actually thinking about, think about that 150 number, thinking about the true amount of ambassadors that are around your, uh, your content, uh, and how are you doing that? If you're still doing that on kind of faceless uh, email lists or sort of spam e email lists, then you know, maybe it is time to just have a little think about how you're doing that. Are you cultivating a community on Facebook? Are you cultivating a community on Twitter? If you are, you know, as I was a few years ago, when my Twitter followers went over a thousand, I was really, woohoo, brilliant, yeah, fantastic, that gets my clout score up and, and everything like that. And then I asked myself the question, am I having any real engagement with some of these? Maybe I'm just engaging with 20 of these people. So, and, and particularly, you know, we can go into a whole another 40 minutes about social search, which I won't, but actually building your network around your content and your newsroom is, is key and something that we, we focus on. Um, 
and so the interesting thing uh, in the global report is 70% didn't actually even provide an option to subscribe, subscribe to email updates or, or, or follow. Um, second one, thou shalt optimize for search. And search is obviously, you know, I'm sure you've all been doing SEO uh, over the years and you've optimized all of your sites for search. And it's a moving target. Search is always such a moving target. We do a lot of work with it at my news desk because you know, one of the reasons that you know, 40,000 companies you know, use us is uh, because they optimize their content for, for search. Um, and particularly when you, you know, when you have a crisis or uh, stuff like that, it's very, very important. Um, and this is what we found is that actually 25% of the top 100 global brands, the top 100 global brands, so you'd expect that they were completely on top of their search games. They had huge dig digital teams that were doing that. They actually failed to rank on page one of Google for brand plus news. So their brand plus news, because quite frankly, they weren't taking their newsrooms very seriously at all. Uh, that, is, that is changing. Um, Thou shalt be open to communicating. This is, I think, actually where uh, Nordic communicators, PR people, and companies are extremely, uh, extremely good. Um, but of the top 100 brands, actually 45% failed to include contact details on press releases. You know, I was amazed when I read that, when I read that sort of statistic, because as someone that, that you know, was schooled a long time ago when I did sort of PR back in university over 15 years ago, you know, that as you're part of your press release, you know, contact details was, was one part. But a lot of people, I think, in, in, in PR, still in the senior positions in PR, said, I hold a relationship with the journalists. I'm only going to talk to journalists. Uh, they know me, I know them, I don't need to put uh, contact details on it. So I was amazed by that uh, statistic, but it was uh, true. Um, and also going along with that, 24% failed to list a phone number for a representative. Um, this is probably one of the most important ones, and I believe that this is the one we're, we're all just starting to get over now. Thou, thou shalt not only communicate with journalists. Um, and um, this is a big one for us, I think, because we've always been schooled that, you know, we're, we're in PR, the marketing people, they can communicate to the consumers. It's our job to do media relations. And even within PR agencies, you know, we're still getting hired to do, you know, media relations work, you know, journalists. Um, that mindset, and we all say that we get it. No, of course, you know, we always communicate with a diverse group of stakeholders and, you know, our PR programs are this. But ultimately, a lot of communicators are still judged on the number of media clips that they get. Uh, and the number of journalists that they know, and the journalist lists and stuff like that. Um, for me, the power of storytelling comes through communicating with a lot wider audience than, uh, than that. This is a nice one on that. If you are not a member of the press, you will not receive a response. Do you know what innovative company, um, anyone want to take a guess of what innovative company made that statement in their newsroom? Google. Uh, interesting, isn't it? Uh, so you go to Google's newsroom, that's what you get in their, uh, in their, uh, in their newsroom. Um, and uh, yeah, so <laughs> there you go. 22% um, didn't provide any value added content. Uh, and this is actually a lesson that I, um, um, that I took from a Finnish company, believe it or not. Um, I used to work with, uh, with, with Nokia a few years ago. And um, this was just when social was sort of taking off in the middle of the 2000s. Uh, and they used to produce re uh, 300 press releases a year. Um, and I used to charge them for each press release, and we used to get them out you know, globally to different audiences, and it was great. And then they asked me to, to come and do a, a session with the, some of the comms team there. Um, and we talked about social. We talked about the importance of blog posts and images and photos and video and all that sort of stuff. Um, and you know, a year later, I came back and said, hey, what's happened, guys? You used to do 300 press releases. Now you do 150 uh, press releases. I said, well, John, you know, it was due to that session with that workshop we had uh, last year. You told us that you know, we need to do more news pieces and blog posts and stuff like that. So we've cut the press releases. But I think it's you know, very, very important that we realize this value-added content, you know, the rise of news pieces, the rise of blogs, you know, photos, videos, and stuff like that. We, again, we all talk about this. We all say, yes, this is what we're doing. But actually, many of us are still stuck in that press release factory type of you know, mindset. I think there's still a, a place very much for the press release. But I think we also need to add, when we're concentrating on storytelling, how much value is this piece of content actually adding to the equation? You know, and it's very, you know, that's also very difficult for PR agencies sometimes. We hire a PR agency uh, as well, and, and part of their retainer is, you know, one press release a month on X. 
Um, but actually, the question I always ask is, how much value are we actually adding to the, the people that we are trying to serve, the stories that we're trying to tell? Um, and that's sort of sometimes a, uh, a challenge. Um, and 22% didn't actually add any, any added, added value content. They were just doing press releases. Um, so that was, uh, but, but some companies are excellent. You know, you look at Cisco, you look at Intel, for example, companies like that that have come up with really interesting collaborative ideas, then that is fantastic. But of course, it's a question of resources uh, versus, you know, the competence also that you have, you know, in-house. Um, thou shalt help people find stuff. Uh, I think this is crucial. Actually, uh, nearly 40% lacked a search function in their newsroom. So if a journalist or a stakeholder or anyone was going into that, that newsroom, they couldn't actually find the stuff that they, they wanted because all they, was, they saw was the latest four press releases or something like that, and they wouldn't stay around. Um, uh, thou shalt take pride in your newsroom. Uh, definitely, you know, this is, this is crucial. Actually, 35% in the global study actually failed to keep their newsroom actually up to date. Um, so some hadn't posted updates for, for ages uh, within their newsroom. This is, again, the top 100 brands in the world we're talking about here, not sort of small companies without um, organisations. Again, you know, Nordic companies are much, much better um, at this. This is probably, thou shalt think visually. I think this is probably one of the biggest changes in public relations uh, and something we're still trying to get to grips with uh, is actually the use of the image. Um, one of, the, one of my friends is now one of the lead lecturers in, uh, at Lund University in Sweden on um, um, PR and strategic communications. And um, when he turned up at the university, a bunch of you know, 19, 20-year-olds, um, he did a survey, what's your preferred search engine? Obviously thinking, because he had a, a nice bit of material on Google that he was going to uh, bring up, um, and it wasn't Google. Do you know what it was, the search engine that was the most favoured by the students there? Anyone? Instagram. Instagram was actually the search in that was being used. You know, it wasn't Facebook, it wasn't Google uh, for information because they were all consuming images all the time. And you know, I certainly grew up in a world where where it was about my writing skills in PR that was my storytelling skills. Um, but I do think that we are now in a fight for attention on the web. Um, and for me, even when I look at you know Facebook feeds and stuff like that, if it's a cool image. I'll be, I'll be attracted to it. If it's in a search engine, it's an image, I'll be attracted to it and I'll be drawn to that blog post or that press release or whatever. Um, and we've done a lot of work at my news desk. We're actually just launching a new newsroom design um, in the next coming weeks. You don't have it in front of you, actually. You have our old design at the moment, which is very good, but this is an even, even stronger one, which leads on image. So every time a person puts out a press release, ultimately, they should be putting an image with that press release. Uh, and I think that is very, very, or the blog post, and that, that is, very, very important. Um, and actually, on the, the global survey, which was actually shocking, again, you're much better here, 40% didn't even have an image library. Um, also, the other one, making movies and videos. Uh, of course, you know, you don't, for me, need to be like an Invisible Children 30-minute Coney 2012 or a Red Bull video, um, but you do need to um, try video a lot, lot more, basically. And not just those really boring technical videos about you know, your products. Actually videos about, you know, customers enjoying your product or employees actually having a good time at work. Amazing, isn't it? Another fantastic thing from the Edelman Trust Index, what's driving trust in public relations? You know, trust in companies used to be about consistent financial returns, ranking on a global league table, an innovative product and stuff like that. Um, trust in, in future companies actually has been proved to be, it's about, um, Actually, are you treating your employees well? Oh, God. Uh, are you actually listening to your customers' feedback and are you engaged with your customer base? Are you putting your customers above your profits? Uh, very, very interesting how trust is moving. Um, but I think um, uh, videos have a lot of power there in opening up the organisation, opening up your employees. Not all of them will want to be on video, but go around, what type of organisation are you? Because for me, you know, we're all about fighting for, for 
resources and talent coming into our organisations. You know, we've grown from, you know, 20 people to 130 people in a very short time, and it's really good to get, it's really difficult to get good people, actually. It doesn't matter what's written, but actually once you get them, you need to attract more of them. Um, I understand that some of you may be in organisations which are down, downsizing, so then it's about actually who do you retain? You retain the, the best people. Um, but the power of the story of your organisation, I believe, is in your employee base. Make videos of them. Make them heroes. Um, yeah, dreadful. Um, I don't need to talk to you about this. Of course, we need to be, uh, to, be, to be social. I think one of the things that came out from the Nordic report was very much about, and you'll probably talk about it, if you're going to be on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, on YouTube, why are you there? Who is it for? Um, and SCA in Sweden have a very good thing. They actually have an explanation of why they're on Facebook and who that's for. Why, they ha why they're on YouTube, who that's for. You know, because one of those platforms will be for customers to communicate with. One of those, one of those platforms will be for employees to communicate there. Um, just from, from our own personal perspective, our Facebook page, um, probably we have a Facebook group at my news desk and it's one of the most engaging places that we internally motivate people because we share stories across an organisation which is now used to be just in Sweden and is now in eight different, different markets. So that's one of the biggest engagement places. And we also find, you know, when we're recruiting a lot of, um, uh, of people, and again, you know, we recruit a lot of, you know, generation Ys that have different, you know, needs. Um, we say, why, why do you want to come and work at my news desk? Well, I've checked out your Facebook page. You know, it seems like you have, you know, such a great time at your company um, and we want to work in an organisation like that. Uh, of course, it's not true that all we do is play table tennis all day, but, you know, from our Facebook page, it's like, oh! And, I, you know, I was in the, 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 the boardroom of our owners the other day, and they all sat around in their suits. You know, gentlemen, you're in your suits. You look very professional. That's very good. And I said to them, do you know what? The people that work with me, they don't want to end up looking like you in a few years' time. We kind of got it wrong in work. Um, they want to be engaged. They want to be on a mission. They want to be changing things. Um, and I know it's very easy to, you know, we don't, we're not going to change the world overnight. Uh, but thinking about that talent is very, and, and, and being social as an organisation and saying the reasons why you're on different platforms. Because I think we all rushed out a couple of years ago and we all got on every single platform, you know, possible. Or we just completely denied it and said, no, we're not going to do that because of management structures or whatever. But I think the next evolution of being social is why you're on that platform and, you know, what stakeholders are you actually addressing um, with that. I'm nearly finished, Johanny, don't worry. Um, and actually also, just go, go tell your story. Because I think that organisations have great stories to tell. Most of those stories happen um, uh, you know, around coffee machines or when people come back from maybe customer meetings or events or, or stuff like that. But very few of those stories actually get told uh, on the web to larger audiences through social channels. Um, so go out there and, and, and tell your story. And I just thought I'd t t take a couple of examples um, from, uh, this is actually the tax authorities in the UK, uh, and they tell some great stories about actually catching criminals, basically, or, or tax avoiders in the UK, and they use their newsroom to actually uh, do that. Um, and I, I, you know, when, when we first entered the UK, I thought, the, the tax authorities were not the first, you know, brand that I would say would go for my news desk, but they're using their newsroom to tell the different stories. So each week, sometimes they have mug shots about, you know, uh, guys that they've caught, and this is the crime that they've done. I guess the story there is don't do what they've done, you know. Um, but it's, it's, it's also, it's a very engaging story. And then I was told a couple of weeks ago, actually, uh, about, this is Oslo Airport, um, and they had a fuel crisis um, earlier this year where they actually ran out of fuel. Uh, and so it was a crisis, it was heavily in the media, and they used their newsroom, uh, and they're you know, a big My News Desk client, they used their newsroom to control that crisis, basically, and to communicate very openly with the media. And in Norway, they actually got a lot of credit for having their network built uh, around their, their newsroom, uh, communicating at very, very regularly, um, and they really came through that crisis brilliantly. So crisis management, your thing, is you know, uh, important. A couple more slides, then you're on about the Nordic report. Um, uh, so the key thing, don't keep it to yourself. There's great, there's great stories within your organisation. Um, your job as communicators and marketeers and PR people, I believe, is to find out what those stories are. 
It involves organisational silos being broken down. It involves actually not just being the standalone comms and PR department, but actually knowing what's going on you know, on the shop floor or in your different business units. And I fully understand that depending on the size of your organisation, the geographical spread of your organisation, some of that activity is easier said than, than done. Um, a great story there is, you know, one of De Denmark's leading companies I went to and they showed me the best video I've ever seen about, um, uh, about a big global organisation. And um, I said, this is amazing, you know, you've got an amazing company, amazing group, you know, so how are you using this video? Oh no, we don't, we only show it to people that come to Copenhagen. And this was a company with, you know, hundreds of thousands of employees. Um, they've changed. But those stories are there in your organisation. Um, and if you, want a, if you want a bit of a tip, there's a great uh, TED talk, actually, on storytelling by a guy called Andrew Stanton. Um, and he's from Pixar. He was one of the uh, creators of Toy Story. Uh, so those of you who have kids, you know, Toy Story was a great uh, thing. And this is probably one of the, the, the thoughts I want to leave you with, uh, actually, uh, is, is what he said in, in that TED talk. So Andrew Stanton from Pixar, go on to TED and, and have a look at that. Uh, when you've got time. I usually end up watching TED Talks like 11 o'clock. But make me care. Please, emotionally, intellectually, and aesthetically, just make me care. Uh, and for me, you know, Johan is now going to show off about how fantastic the leading Finnish brands uh, uh, are uh, in, in, in using their newsrooms. I would say that very, very, very few companies achieve this. And I think this is the mission that we are on as corporate communicators, as, as, as people that are taking more and more responsibility for storytelling and actually media per se, you know, again, another 45 minutes on brand journalism and content marketing. Uh, but if we can actually take each piece of content that we put out and ask ourselves the question, actually, is this piece of content, whether it be a blog post, a press release, a video, uh, a photo, is it really adding value to the people I'm trying to communicate with? Uh, does it would, it, would I care about this piece of content? Uh, is it sparking me intellectually? Is it pulling on any emotional strings? And does it look good? Uh, if we could, I mean, if we can achieve that, you know, then fantastic. We won't always be. But don't just think about the technology. Yes, technology changes communications. We need to have that in place. But for me, is our content emotionally engaging will be the key to our success. That's it from me. You can come and tell us how fantastic Finnish communications people are now. <laughs> any any questions?